<laughs> Maybe I'll... there. I think you guys will all see that it's being shared. Yeah, yeah. Pugrim has got it, and I've got it, but I I'm with the yeah. jellyfish, so you can't oh, see yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Plugger, what's the journal great. Yeah, I was so happy to have that. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the journal that you were published? It's called Young Scholars in Writing. Yeah. And it's undergraduate researchers. Wow. Yeah. What they were, start, huh? They uh they had the idea that they wanted to do a scholarly article mm -hmm. and they slogged through two rounds of peer review, I believe. Wow. And yeah. we spent hours working um collaboratively on those um references. We all had kind of we went and got a little snack and we all sat there in that cafeteria yeah, just we working were... away and <laughs> arguing about where to put the commas and <laughs> 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 oh, it was fun. That was fun. It was a lot so, of work. So, so as you know, by by way by way of introduction, um, let me go ahead and and share my screen. Oh, look who's coming on! Hi, Nadia and Viv. Oh, hi, hi Viv. And Viv and Oh, you're all here. And then well, we're missing Key yet, but oh yeah, yeah. And then Once Janet, uh, Francisco. Yeah, J Janet. Janet's one of my colleagues. This is, this ah, is hi, Janet. Nice. Yes, Janet hi everybody. How good are you? Good to see you. Good, good to see, to see you. you. Well, I mean, good to know that you're there. We can't actually okay. see you. Okay, Janet, yeah, yeah. Janet, Janet's the director of our um uh, our Janet. Are you still calling it an ESL program now? Uh, uh yes. <laughs> That's a great question <laughs> because <laughs> it's something that we are trying hard to rethink. They know how we should call. I like multilingual. That's why I'm here. Multilingualism is my field of study. And I, I am working my dissertation right now. And I just got my comps. I passed my comps in September. Hey. <laughs> so yeah. I'll work on that. Where did, you, where did you do Where did you do the PhD, Janet? University of Iowa. Oh, so oh, you have to make it my new. hometown. Yeah, I, I, I had to. I yes. yes, I had to commute for four years going okay. there, <laughs> but it's worth it every single time. I felt okay. alive and learning all these beautiful things about language. It's my passion. In English is not my first language, so <laughs> it's a real passion. Let me, beautiful. Let me, do, let me do a real quick introduction here, so that. Um, so that I have something that, that looks like it's focused for crying out loud, right? Um, this is a Teacher Talk Presents. Uh, I'm Galen Leonhardy. Um, I, I, I work with a, with a few other people to try to keep Teacher Talk going and to share um, uh, these, these, these wonderful video interviews uh, that are somewhat like podcasts, but I, I do them uh, through, the, through, the, through the campus uh, Zoom process. Um, this one is Understanding Multilingual Students' Perspectives. It's a conversation with multilingual students from Michigan State University um, and with uh, their faculty colleagues, I guess I said their team members, um, uh, regarding the, the Four C's presentation that I was able to see um, uh, just uh, a month ago. Um, and so we want to talk about that learners, faculty produced, why don't they videos if we have time, uh, and to also... Um, uh, cover the cover the idea of having multilingual students in our classes, which is what uh, this this team was able to communicate so well. Um, let me get off of the the sharing here. Um, oops, I need to stop sharing. There it is. It's the red button. Now we have everybody here. Um, we see that 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 I have a, a colleague of of ours from Blackhawk. This is this happens every once in a while. We get one or two people who come in who listen, and then I um, I share the video with with um, all of my faculty and with the uh, uh, with staff personnel and and anybody else who who's interested in it. Um, Janet, it's a pleasure to have you here. We have Joyce Meyer. Uh, with whom I spent some time in in China in Harbin, and and uh, I, uh, uh, when we were when we did a um, a teachers um, exchange there, I guess it was kind of an exchange where um, we were the examples of what American scholars are like. <laughs> Cheryl, I only met you at the presentation. 
Um, it's it's good to see you. Um, you as well. talk, yeah. Um, if you, uh, why don't we just go around and, and if you could introduce yourselves, um, I would appreciate that. Starting with starting with Cheryl. Okay, so I'm Cheryl Caesar. I uh, have been teaching in the first year writing program or in the writing program at Michigan State for about 12 years now um, with with Joyce as my wonderful associate director. Uh, and I before that, I lived for about 25 years in Europe, mainly in Paris, but I also spent summers in Tuscany and in Sligo in Republic of Ireland. So I had um, an experience of living and studying and also teaching in a foreign country, in a foreign language. I sometimes wish that all of our teachers could have that experience because I think it would help a lot um, just to understand uh, what it's like to be the other, to be the outsider. But um, when I came to MSU, I we had a, a very high international student enrollment and I taught a lot of our bridge class preparation for college writing, which would be about 80% international students or sometimes more. So there was a lot of opportunity for translingual pedagogy and for um, culturally supportive pedagogies. And Joyce and I and some other colleagues have worked a lot on those. So um, when Joyce had this uh, project in mind for a student video team, uh, she talked to me and I recruited uh, some of my most promising students, especially Plagrim and Hayden, who's um, not with us today, but he has worked on the project. And it's been, what, two years now? More, 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 three years. I think three. And then there was another year beforehand, before Cheryl came on board the project, I worked with a prior teacher who actually was from China um, originally, and she and I had a group, a different group of students who have since graduated. So the first video was actually made by a different team. Um, as time has gone on, the, the group has shifted depending on, well, we have two students in the room right now who have made it to graduate school. So they'll be entering graduate school next fall and we will no longer have the pleasure of working with them so much at MSU. Um, but that's that's the way that the team works. So maybe, maybe we could hear from the students, have them all introduce themselves. That would be really nice. So how about Key? Uh, so hi. Um... Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Ki Kim Rock. I'm from Thailand. I'm a senior this year studying um, supply chain management. So really excited to be here. And I'll pass it on to program. Hey, my name is Plagrim, or like my first name is Pichaya. And I also come from Thailand. And then uh, I I study, um, and I'm a senior studying GIS, uh, Geography Information Science, which uh going to graduate soon. Key and I are going to graduate soon, uh, leaving the team. So that's the sad part. But yeah, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Caesar say, like I uh, contribute to the team lessons. I remember maybe like spring 2009, um, 2019 or like, yeah, it's very like it's three years ago. Pandemic. It was, we started just pandemic. right before the pandemic. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm her, her student in the first year writing a class and then uh, I've heard as an international students like uh, the team uh, I have heard for uh, to like be sharing the opinion or uh, as an international student being the class and I was like the first year just perfect timing for the like, first year experience the university as an international student so I interested to like just share my opinion but after that it's like inspired me to like okay this need to like do something more so yeah that's the, the the beginning of like the contributing to the team and then later on like i know key and i uh also like uh she also interested in like i explained to her like what i'm doing and then she's like really interested to the team and also she's a big part of, like contributing to the the research part uh as our project is like kind of dividing into the two part uh the the very first 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 thing that we do is we produce the video projects uh in like videos to to communicate to other like prof uh, professor and students i am the um kind of like the artist of the team like uh 
I mean, I am the the cartoon character drawing in the video, which you you will see later maybe if we have chance to show our video, and then later we decide to like after we do the video and we decide to like okay we're gonna do more of like what we're doing so the team kind of like separate the work yeah and then later on like we have more member because like our projects is very interesting and getting more of the friends like international students as uh one of our uh, member Nadir. Would you, you would like to introduce yourselves? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Nadia. I'm a sophomore majoring in psychology. I'm from Malaysia, and I'm also taking a minor in Japanese as well. So I know English, Malay, Japanese, and I can read a little bit of Arabic. So a lot of things going on. Um, I actually, uh, how I came into this group was that I saw their project uh, presented at URA, which is like a showcase, research showcase here at MSU. And I emailed the professors asking if I, if I could contribute somehow. And um, that was like last year, around this time as well. So it's been fun. Thank you for having me. I'll pass it to Vivian. Hi everyone, thank you for having me today. My name is Vivian. I'm a junior here studying supply chain management at MSU. I'm more of a newer member to the team. I joined the team recently last semester. Um, I'm now working as like a videographer for this team and I'm really excited to be able to pursue uh, and include multilingual students like such as myself. Um, I'm a student who was born in Detroit, Michigan, but my first language was actually Spanish because my parents immigrated to the United States. So I'm excited to put my own perspective to the team and also include the international and bring it all together. So yeah. Mm -hmm. It is so wonderful to have you here. Um, Janet, I should have you introduce yourself too. I apologize. Really? You said everything. <laughs> well, I mean, I was yeah. I was actually waiting for the moment to say I'm passing it on to Janet. Oh, and, you know, just like, just like they are. I'm learning. I'm learning this Zoom behavior. Yeah, how to, how to be polite on Zoom. Oh, okay. I can be. I, I can give a brief introduction. I have. Um, I am here at Black Hawk College with our colleague here, Galen Hart, and I work with the academic ESL program. Um, I teach, I have been teaching here for 15 years now, and I definitely, it is one of the best experience. And I really, like I said, multilingualism is my passion and, and that's what I pursue now. So I am just so happy to be here and, and listening to all this beautiful, um, you know, I like to say <laughs> this is stories. I love to hear stories. I'm a storyteller myself. And I think we learn a lot with this, perspective from the students and being a multilingual myself it is uh, it's like Cheryl said it's so it's so interesting when you are the other and you experience that and I'm so glad that you had this opportunity to put all these people together in and, and give their perspective the other side of the story so thank you and, and so real quick I'll, I'll pass it on to Joyce because I didn't I don't think I completed a proper introduction well, it's okay. Um, I'm just going to say that how this, pro I'm going to just start talking about the project because I'm so excited about it. So about, um, I want to say about maybe eight or nine years ago, when we had this big influx of international students on our campus that Cheryl and I and about four or five other faculty members and two administrators started to meet every single month to solve the problem, quote unquote, of all those international students. That bridge course, nobody wanted to teach it because a lot of the teachers did not have background in um, teaching multilingual students. Um, it was a course that um, had a funny number of hours and credits. It still to this day has that system. But most importantly, we felt like there was no set curriculum for it. I mean, we were told to teach the same exact class as the one that followed it, only minus one assignment. So those of us who taught it would have these long discussions like, well, do you want to get rid of that one? Well, what about that one? Because we have five standard project assignments in our regular first year writing class. And we just said, this is ridiculous. So we started to work with a um, advisory committee that was under first year writing. And we pulled those teachers together to meet regularly to figure out a different curriculum for the course. 
And we started to read a lot of um, translingual pedagogy, which is the pedagogy that informed a lot of the decisions that we made about how to teach the course differently. And one of the first things we did over time was to change the outcomes for the course so that students' languages and cultures were framed as assets, as resources for learning, and as sites of inquiry. And once you frame that differently, everything else can change. Mm -hmm. So from there then, after we developed all these fun assignments, we published some articles, we kept going, we thought we need to have some student voices because when we went around campus, there were a lot of opportunities. I was part of a learning community for two years that was made up of teachers from around the campus. Another teacher and I, who was part of that original group within our department, we'd go to these meetings and we'd hear people from other departments say, well, why can't they just write perfectly grammar? Or why can't they um, listen and understand our lectures? Or why, if you could only teach them this or that. This or that is kind of the pet peeve grammar theory. Yes. My pet yes. peeve is when there's inconsistent verb tenses or right. subject verb disagreement. And I don't tolerate that. But, you know, classes shouldn't be, a curriculum shouldn't be designed according to some of these pet peeves. Right. So after having all these discussions, we thought, let's make some videos with students or form a get together a student team who can help us make videos or make the videos themselves that talk about what they see from their side, what their own experiences are like. So that's how the group originated. And the first teacher and two students and I made the first video, which was called, Why Won't They Understand My Lecture? And in each of the videos, there's this pattern of first showing the situation from the teacher's side. Like you see the teacher, why won't they understand? And they're lecturing or whatever they're doing. And then over time, you see it from the student side. So the whole idea of the video is to unmask or make visible um, what we call the invisible classroom that teachers don't see. And then the other move in the video is to say, what is the problem here and what are some solutions? And for each of the videos, the team has done various forms of research into what research says about each of the issues involved and also made the video. And the videos are beautifully animated, partly because we have Pogram's talented artistic abilities. Um, but, and they're also fun. And one of the reasons the team chose to do that from the very beginning is they didn't want to offend their audience. They hoped to get their message across in such a way so that the audience, the faculty audience, they imagined seeing the videos could watch them and hear the message and understand the message and then change their teaching accordingly. So that's unless, does anybody want to add anything to that? Because I think we could move to the first video so everyone could see it for starters. Does that sound anything else? Because I was trying to set it up. <laughs> so Pogram, oh yeah. Do you have something, Galen? No, no, I was just gonna, okay. I was just gonna encourage her to go ahead and share it and, and yes. find out if I've been able to master this this button clicking that would allow her to do the sharing. Yeah, well, um, we have share screen. I have share screen, so I imagine right. um Pogram does too. I can have kind of add on to that a little bit. Yes, um, please. Just, I, I feel like we spend a lot of time talking about like, how can we possibly, you know, like teach the professor who like well educated for so many years and they've been teaching for so many years and tell them what to do. It's kind of like impossible job to do. <laughs> so I think we spend a lot of time discussing about that. And that's kind of like the, the most challenging for us. Um, and that's kind of like um, the main theme for us. Like, how do we convince them like well-educated people to like believe us and like, maybe like open their heart and hear students perspective and student voice so i might just add one thing that that's such an important point about the form that we chose but i'd just like to say one thing about the content um the students brainstormed each topic like um unfamiliar cultural references in lectures or um, unrealistic grammatical demands or, 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 or difficult, uh, unseen difficulties in using Zoom. Those were brainstormed from their own experience, but then they did the research to see whether this was a more mm -hmm. widespread problem. They, they read the scholarly secondary sources, they did surveys, mm -hmm. um, just to be sure that, that these were indeed um, salient issues. So, that, that's what the foundation of these fun videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So you want me to share? Mm -hmm. You don't know. Yeah, I will share it. One moment, please. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start and hit share. So this is uh the YouTube channel of our team that can contains the our all of the videos, which in the series why one day, and then I can start the first one, which is why one day understand more the truth. This is the old team. We did this one. Today we are going to continue our discussion of an important concept: supply demand equilibrium. And I want to talk about this in relationship to last night's game. How many of you watched it? What a bummer that Justin Lane is leaving us for the NFL. So today we are talking about the supply-demand curve and how the equilibrium price may adjust in response to events. As you can see from the diagram on the board, on the x-axis there is a QD which stands for quantity demanded, while on the P, on the y-axis, stands for price. Note that the supply curve is upward sloping, while the demand curve is downward sloping. That is to say, the higher the price, the lower the demand. The higher the supply here, the lower the price. You can see this in the diagram because if you move across to the right, if you have a higher supply, your price will drop. One way to think about the effect of events on equilibrium in the supply-demand curve is to consider a parallel from football. Here you have the offense players lined up and the defense responds by lining up to match the offense's formation to create equilibrium. Now the diagram on the right shows what happens when there is a similar event. Let's say that the defensive middle linebacker or quarterback calls an audible to take advantage of what they see as another alignment in the offense. On defense, the linebacker switches the play, switching his teammates to the left to adjust, just like the equilibrium price does above. I'm in the midst of applying for residency right now. <laughs> we'll all wish him luck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You'd have to have seen that video sometime. <laughs> I, I I just hear the hear the, the cheering from all over the nation for that one. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm 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 listening. Uh, you know, find out how this evolves. This, this oh, 
Yeah, so that's uh the one that you would just see uh is the first video which we uh which is uh country um is the work from the previous team of the the group as uh Dr. Meyer uh addressed before um that one of the students from China he uh with the team he did a video and then present the topic uh of why don't they understand my lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, at first we doesn't have we doesn't have a name, but like when we like contribute the video later on, and we kind of like decide on the the series of the video why one day. So we name is like the first one why won't they understand the lecture uh, our lecture. That's one like um to like in the as, as you can see like in the video like uh there is this situation like the real situation like going on in class the student would like to like show like what is going on in the the mind of like the international student mind when they actually like, explain the class and it's turning like this video like um the professor explaining the the the, the meaning of some word in the economic class but not only the meaning but use the example which the example is very US centric, which is American football, which apply on like the topic. So the international student, they need to understand both of them to understand the content. So that's why like sometimes the like, international student lost the um lost the content and then not be able to understand because like they have more than one thing to focus on because they don't understand anything. Like in, like even the example doesn't help them because it's very US centric. Yeah. So the exam that example also came up. It was something that had happened to you, Young, in a class where the teacher had used football to explain some kind of concept. We took it out of the original classroom and we chose to put it in an economics class instead, partly because one of my sons is an economics major and he was able to write the script um, because I know nothing about football and I don't know a lot about economics. So we got him involved to help us write that script. So you're in yeah. the same position as those international students. There's an analogy. Right. <laughs> an analogy should have one unfamiliar and one familiar part, but they're both unfamiliar. Yeah. Right. But one of the things that happened, another thing that sort of provoked that topic was that in that faculty group, and we were working with all these faculty, they kept talking about how um, the idea of kinship was very difficult for some Chinese students to understand in an anthropology class because brothers and sisters, the teacher kept using the brother and sister analogy. And many of the students we had did not have brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So you can expand that idea you know, of cultural allusions to all kinds of other ways of thinking. Uh, a botany teacher kept using a rose in order to make connections to the study of plants. But the rose is a plant that's only familiar to people in certain parts of the world. So that was another kind of discussion. So, you know, we the thing is, Cheryl and I and, and the student group have used these videos in faculty workshops as a way to kind of provoke discussion and to have the faculty themselves think about examples that they're sort of taking for granted. They've done the lecture for years. They use the same um, prototypes or same tropes or whatever. And then they have to rethink those um, done real familiar things to them, but not necessarily to their students. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the impulse behind the video, this first one. Can I jump in real quick with the, with this this question uh, for, for the, the student member, the learner members of the team. Um, what, you know, since we said, okay, we have this problem of problematizing that's going on here, right? Which is so necessary. It's gonna shake up the ideology. They're gonna to have to look, you know, we have to, we, I have to look at myself. I have to say, okay, well, what exactly is it I'm doing to other people here? Um, which is, you know, here, here we have this traumatic question, right? Which you framed in a rhetorically savvy way. Um, it's, you know, it's not an attack. It's, uh, you know, we're not trying to alienate, we're trying to have some respect for where we come from. And it, it, it allows us to perceive, you know, a, a new perspective, right? What, what kinds of solutions are, 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 going, are going to help here? What, what, what kinds of things can, can faculty members, um, even staff, what can, what can people do to, to overcome this, this issue? I can I can go yeah go ahead. That's a question for the students, so go ahead. Right. 
So I, I think it's quite presumptuous that uh, just the professor kind of assumed that everyone will know like American football. And um, even now, like I'm studying a lot of like economic class. I'm still like confused every time I watch the video. So it's <laughs> still hard for me to like, so understand. So you already understand economics, but yes. it's confusing you. <laughs> it's yes, because, what you already know. Yeah, because I have no idea what American football is or like how it works um, in the first place. And even now, kind of like living in the U.S. for for quite some time now, um, I'm still like have a difficult time. It's just not my interest, basically. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like it's um, the professor might uh or should have an, an awareness that not everyone have the exact same interest as um, himself um, or, you know, like as a big group. So it's kind of like um, maybe like use. I, I feel like there's so many ways to explain this simple um, economics theory. So maybe come up with like some other ways that not using, you know, just one um, particular interest to kind of like explain everything and like make an assumptions that everyone will understand or like have the exact same interest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder, I'm just thinking of this for the first time, whether this professor's aim in using the football analogy is partly intellectual to explain, but it might also be kind of an attempt to bond with his students and to Mm -hmm. share an interest, in which case, once again, um, Mm -hmm. it would be best to find out what the students' actual interests are. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is really a kind of cultural imperialism involved. I mean, if you can think about the fact that this football is not football in the rest of the world, football is something quite different. Um, But we assume that everyone knows and loves this football. So and also, actually, the teach what you what you're saying is that the teacher might want to get to know the students something something mm-hmm. that outlandish. And connect with them and bond with them over a shared interest or pastime. So, uh, and uh, also just a fun fact: we don't call it so- like we call it, we we think of football as soccer. <laughs> it's like <laughs> part yeah. of the world. So. <laughs> Well, I'm from Brazil. Soccer is our life. (laughs) (laughs) So I can say I can say I had a similar experience in statistics and my my professor used baseball. I have no idea what baseball is and the vocabulary and Mm -hmm. and the what the analogy he was talking about. But exactly I like this this words that awareness how to to be aware what kind of students we have in class and mainly i love what dr cesar or cheryl said it's about learning what is my student's interest not my interest what they are interested some are in art video or other kind of music so why i not adapt that to my class that or my proposal you know how to teach but yes this is what i love love in this example can I have the the address in YouTube to mm-hmm. the okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I can share um the sorry, the the link to our YouTube channel is under the chat now. So there is a uh, where you can you can find other videos which I think if we sh- we can possibly they show mm-hmm. as well later on. So I just want to point out like okay, so that's the problem, like so Professor, I, we just like as an international student, we think like so just like ask for some of the awareness. Like sometimes we're not familiar with the topics or some of the uh like traditional things that like football or even some of the American student doesn't know mm-hmm. the football, like not not excuse like as international student, but like some of my friends do not familiar with the rules and everything. So yeah, just do aware and yeah, and just be aware that not not assuming like all of everyone gonna understand and have the same interest. But sometimes like if there's the professor just say it up, uh, say say not not football but other things, but you feel like, well, yeah, I know I, I'm interested in that one, but I don't understand that. But I, I wanna have more clarify or like more of that. But like sometimes as an international student, it's very hard to just like jump in and they say, Hey professor, I quite not understand. <laughs> what are you talking about? Or like, can you explain more? Because like sometimes, like as me, like in the first year, I tend to like 
very quiet in the class, even though like, I'm very talkative outside. Because like in the class, I feel like if I say something wrong in the class, I'm gonna point it out or like my point is like gonna go away. Like I'm very scared to like just raise my hand and answer to the question and everything. So yeah, I I was like, yeah, sometimes like that that that's concern uh international students as well. So that's like I I think yeah. Sorry. The fear of speaking in class was, in fact, uh, part of our second video. Yeah. Just, I was just yeah. thinking, good introduction to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to like, jump in because like, that's the, the, the part. Like, I, I watched that video and then I share what I experienced. So that's like what a part of like, the big part of like being in the national student, like not speaking it up because like we just don't know how to speak it because um, it, English is not our first language and just like just need time for like just like speaking it up and we just like try so a lot of professor like just like asking us like why didn't they talk why didn't they talk to us like why are they so quiet like why didn't they talk like they're in office hours why did they come and talk to me or in class why didn't they just talk to me so it's like they in in their backgrounds they just see like we so quiet as international student but inside my head like inside our international student head in in our mind just like everything going on ev the answer the to everything but sometimes it's in our own language we need just we just cannot produce and then just like speaking it out so yeah uh when the team like interested in this this part because yeah dr mayor to say say like a lot of the professors just come and crying to her like why don't they just talk to me like they're so quiet yeah you want to share about that mm -hmm. yeah and then i uh we 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 like yeah this is like the story like why we come to like the second video why won't they talk yeah mm -hmm. nice segue nice transition yes nice intro <laughs> <laughs> And here you can see my art now because I start yeah. doing it in this video. Yay. <laughs> yes. So yeah. is reading from day to L and trying to prepare himself for class, such as translating the vocabulary and reading the material. Today we're going to learn about racial dynamic shifts that came out of socioeconomic changes from Jim Crow South in the post-Civil War period uh, from 1960, 1865 until about 1940. Wow, this is too much. Jim Crow was... Did you get that? Oh no, not at all. He's already on the next slide. I wish I could have seen the previous slide. Will she put a slide on DTRL? I know, I hope so. Okay, today I'm going to have you read a relatively short article on Durkheim's theory of suicide. So here are the copies of the article. You have 15 minutes to read and to answer the questions on the last page of the article, and no speaking to your neighbors during this time. Well, this is 20 pages. I would never finish in time. Oh, man. That's why I don't do well in this class. The vocabulary is so hard. I have to look it up so many words. Hey, Maria. What are schemas? I'm confused about the definition. Uh, I have no idea, but I'm going to use my translator on my phone. Be quiet, guys. It's reading time now, not discussion time, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, Maria. That's all right, but we don't get a chance to know what it actually means. Oh boy. Why does everyone flip over pages so fast? I just finished page number three. Should I ask the professor? But how should I ask? I know what to say. Is he going to blame it on me? Okay guys, now it's discussion time. You should be talking to your neighbors and making friends with them because we're gonna be 
doing this every class. But I'm only on page 12. I know what to say, but my idea isn't right. Are they going to listen to me? I know. To be honest, I haven't finished the reading yet. So do I. I'm not sure if we're gonna survive in this class. I believe we will. Right, let's see. Um, he might be asking us about human development. Do you have any idea on that? I didn't get a chance to read that part. All right, everyone, time to share as a class. Uh, so what do you think evolution is? D do you believe in evolution? Oh, I know the answer. I read it last night, but I don't know how to say language. Yes, uh, go ahead. Evolution is a change in characteristics of biological populations over generations. I do believe in evolution because I feel like humans share similar characteristics with primates and thus probably share a common ancestor. That is a great way to look at it. Great job. Um, I'm not going to volunteer any more answers. Mm. This professor does not give me enough time. I know the answer. I need more time to say it. And the national crowd is cheering. <laughs> applause coming from everywhere. Wonderful I think artwork. that the hidden classroom is especially well revealed on this one because we do have the interior monologue of the students. And we do see explanations for behaviors that some professors don't understand. They're, they're looking at their phones. Do they realize that these students are looking up words on their mechanical translators? We're trying yeah. to, to find answers. Yeah, uh, I actually didn't work on this video because I wasn't on the team when this video was produced, but I presented it at the CCC uh, convention. And I found it very interesting because I found it very relatable as well, because everything in that view, I was just like, yeah, that's me. That Literally, that student is me. Because I have Google Translate open on my phone every moment, like every class, especially now I'm taking harder classes as I like move on to university and you know all the words seem you know very they, I know they're English but I've never encountered them in my life in my whole entire 20 years of learning English so and it's very it, it very it spoke to me like I, and I found it very relatable because that's what I do. And, you know, some professors don't really understand that I'm really struggling with the vocabulary that's in this class because they don't understand why I don't know English. But I do know English. It's just that I had I I take time to translate the words into my own native language. And one of the examples I gave during the convention was that some words have a direct English translation, but some words don't. And an example I really like that I encountered was the word encapsulation in English. And it translates to encapsulasi in Malay. And it's basically encapsulation, but with a Malaysian pronunciation. And that tells me nothing about the word. Mm -hmm. And I have to look up, the, look up the word in a dictionary. And it, usually this isn't a bad thing. You know, that's how we learn language. That's how we learn new vocabulary is to learn, look up words in dictionary. But I can't do this during class when the professor is talking at a lightning speed and I can't keep up with the lecture notes on the slides and stuff like that. So this video, even even if I didn't work on it personally, it, it uh, spoke to me very well and I found it very relatable and very comforting to know that other international students also went through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our former collaborator, Dr. Wang, I did some research into the hidden classroom and um, 
if I remember correctly, discovered that there will be sort of an unofficial leader uh, of, say, the Chinese students in the classroom, and everyone is turning to him or her to say, what's this word? What are they talking about? Uh, the professor may be quite unaware of this and just think this this student is a chatterbox. Why are they always, you know, talking? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a whole dynamic going on there as the students are trying to create uh, a system to help them cope with the class. Mm -hmm. Or worse, they are accused of cheating mm. somehow, and they're not cheating at all. They're just trying to figure out how to survive. And that is a topic that we really, really want to deal with before the project disbands is culturally inflected notions of cheating and plagiarism. Mm -hmm. so important. Yeah, that's going to be, that'll be extremely helpful here. I see, mm -hmm. I, I, I see, I see a lot of that accusation going on and, and, mm -hmm. and not understanding that, um, you know, even, even copying work is still a part of that process of learning to, to paraphrase and to, to gain the vocabulary. Mm -hmm allows that. And I look forward to that part of the conversation too, please. Mm -hmm. Well, copying is often a way of learning in a second language. One copies to learn. So it's not necessarily plagiarizing. It's an attempt to understand. Plus the other thing that Sonia Wang, the person who was the former partner in this endeavor, um, wrote and talked about a lot was culturally different habits of expectations of talking in classrooms. In cultural, in certain cultural traditions, the teacher is the authority, the teacher speaks, everyone listens. So the very idea of, you know, I remember the first time I made a circle in that bridge writing class with my students, they were like, what is she doing? You know, they weren't, you're not supposed to do that. We're all supposed to talk. We're all supposed to go around in a circle and talk. The idea of how discussions work as a, you know, in this culture, is very much a cultural phenomenon, an American or U.S. specific phenomenon that doesn't always translate the same way in other cultures. So that can be an obstacle as well. And just kind of like add on to mm -hmm. everything, um, how the story, like the story lie, lie up as we intended to, um, you know, put the most important one first, kind of like, because when you learn the new language, it's kind of mm -hmm. like you have to understand the language first. So that's why we come up with like how to, why don't, why won't you understand the lecture first? And then uh, after that, it's kind of like uh, response to what you understand, like kind of respond to the conversations, having the conversations with others. Um, and I think that's a good transition to the next one, which is like mm -hmm. after that, kind of like, okay, now we got to, communicate properly how do we write it down um in a sense of like you know like more in a f more formal way i would say so yay i'm super excited to see it you're gonna go you're gonna go ahead and show it then yeah uh, one moment please so here's um, uh, this the professors who complained to joyce why won't they make their subjects and verbs agree <laughs> why won't they use a definite article here is the why one day write grammar degree. You ever got that paper or assignment due? The clock is ticking. You're busy typing away and all the words just seem to fall into place. You're feeling super confident with what you're about to turn in. But once the grades come round, it's not quite what you expect. Well, that's the story of Stephen. Meet Stephen. He's a first year international student in his writing class. He has been hard at work writing his paper, but things don't always go to plan. Oh no, a D minus. I worked so hard. How did this happen? So, how did this happen? Let's take a closer look at what's taking note. The person that I would like to have lunch with is Brand Pitt, my favorite American actor. She was appeared in many movies, but the one I love the most is Fight Club. This movie had a lot of good and meaningful scenes too. That is why I like her. Now let's see what the professor has to say. Hmm. I don't really understand what this student is trying to say. The grammar is all over the place. Why did this student not use the proper article? Here's a pronoun mistake, an unclear tenses. 
It's a confusing sentence. Surely it's not that hard to proofread and see the mistakes? This is just so frustrating. Why won't they just write grammatically? Let's take a pause here. Okay, pop quiz. As of 2016, how many people speak English as a second language? Is it A, over 1 million, B, over 500 million, or C, over 1 billion? The answer is C, over 1 billion. Approximately 1.5 billion people speak English worldwide, and 1 billion of those people use it as their second language. So, it might seem easy and simple for a native English speaker like the professor to spot all the mistakes. However, things are a bit different when your mother tongue is in a different language. Let's take a look. Over 400 million people in the world speak Arabic. In Arabic, dual form is created with a suffix, which means two. No quantifier is used before the noun and the meaning is held in the suffix. So, for example, if the desired sentence is, there are two books at the library for you. It might be written instead as, there are books at the library for you. Or, there are two book at the library for you. A student can easily forget to add an S or ES at the end of a noun in English to signify more than one. Or, omit a quantifier word and a noun phrase to show a number of items. Likewise, a student may apply the suffix s to every noun, but there are non-count nouns, exceptions, spelling changes, and irregular forms to remember. Additionally, the Arabic language is read from right to left, instead of left to right as in English, and there is no distinction between upper and lowercase letters. Meanwhile, in Korean and Japanese, adjective clauses are positioned before the noun, and Relative pronouns are not used. So, for example, instead of saying, we can meet at the park, which is close to my house, it might be phrased as, meet at the park is close to my house, or meet at the park close to my house. Since relative pronouns are not used in Korean, it's often overlooked in English. This is difficult when the relative pronouns is the subject of the adjective clause and cannot be omitted. For example, the target sentence may be, this experiment has a type of research that is interesting to me, but it might be phrased as, this experiment has a type of research is interesting to me. As for Mandarin, the language does not have articles or verb tenses, while English does. Different languages around the world have varying structures and rules. Students produce English influenced by their first, second, or third languages. So if a student has spent years developing skills in a language other than English, they may still transfer traits from that language over into English, despite ongoing corrections and English language studies. It's important to keep an open mind. Everyone has varying English proficiency skills. Their English might work fine as a lingua franca in an international context, but oftentimes the professor's response is to correct all errors. This correction may overwhelm and even cause embarrassment. Navigating the vast diversity of languages and linguistic backgrounds of students can be difficult. So here are a couple of things to keep in mind. One. Correction is not necessarily instruction. Just circling all the errors may not be entirely helpful to a student. If there's a consistent pattern of grammatical concern, teach that to the student and provide ample opportunities for the student to practice this correction. Two, don't sweat the small stuff. Does a count or non-count noun impact meaning? Does the lack of an article confuse what's being said? If not, is it worth taking off all those points? Sometimes the main point of a paper can be delivered without grammatical accuracy, and that's okay. Three, ensure that the criticism matches the mistake. Framing critiques in the most positive way possible encourages students. It's important to propose helpful solutions and teach students how to address the problem. 
this is a good way to utilize helpful online resources like Owl Purdue. By doing so, students are able to look up any grammatical concerns or questions they may have. And remember, when in doubt, ask for clarification. Asking is a great way to engage the students and to start conversations about their English skills. It will help shrink the gap between educator and learner. Four, grading what you have taught helps students focus on the class material. If your class is not on grammar, should you be assessing for it? Five, consider what is working, fluency or clarity, perhaps the knowledge shared or created. Help students see what is successful, not just what is wrong. Writers benefit from knowing what they did well, so they can use these moves again. Learning a new language, attending university in a different country is challenging and scary enough on its own. So it's vital that we encourage them. And who knows, maybe they just might surprise you. How many, how many people are currently involved in this group? Is it, is it the, the four of you or are there, are there more? There are, there are more. Um, there are one, uh, how, how do you say, uh, the, first, so the first students is already like graduated as the work, the first video. And then uh, there come, uh, I think two, and me, and then another person is Hayden. She, he's from China. He's already graduated uh, and uh, one person is Claudia, who is uh, according to Bluetooth, the third video of which you just say she uh, the uh, the narrator and the script writer for, for for the editor for the video, and um, Claudia is from Indonesia. Yeah, and Hanadia is from Indonesia. And then, and then, how will you? How will you? How do you plan to continue this? I don't want to get too far away from the videos and the content and your perceptions, but I want to add in this stuff real quick. Yeah, uh, we, um, as you see, we, we have a lot of the concern issue for like international students. There's a lot more to say, but like we finalizing lately, since the last last year, last couple of years, we experienced um, the era of like the, the pandemic of COVID-19. And then all of the students, I can say like all, because like everyone that need to be online, like study online, and then we like try to like make it in the series, so I want to like soon. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, Vivian would, would know best about this because um, she and Pr Pragram now kind of like work on that pro project currently, so. She, she's the script writer for, for... Yeah, so if you want to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to give too much about the new video coming out soon. Can we tell them, can we say, can we mention the black boxes? Because I yeah, think... Yeah, yeah. So like the whole concept about our fourth video is like what's behind the screen, right? So mm -hmm. on a daily basis, we always wonder what a person is thinking or what they're going through because we honestly don't even know. But it's a whole nother level when we start to include international students and multilingual students, you know? There's a lot of things that we struggle with and that we go through, but we never speak about it. We never really bring awareness to it because either we don't want to seem weak or we don't like we're just too afraid to like ask for help right because like I know for me specifically growing up I always had to do everything myself so like I have this mentality of like I don't want to ask for help because I know I can do it but sometimes I do want help it's just difficult for me to reach out for help if that makes sense because like my mind works different because I was brought up learning both Spanish and English at the same time so I'm not 100% fluent in English but I'm not 100% percent fluent in Spanish so I kind of found like this really weird thing so I experienced things that other students may not experience so in order to kind of like help the audience look into for example my life or Plagram's life or Key's life we're kind of trying to produce a video that's like why don't they like zoom but focusing more of like what's behind the screen what's behind our minds what are we actually living on a day-to-day basis -day 
basis because all international and multilingual students, we multitask. If there's one thing we know what to do is to multitask. Like we are always handling so many things and so many things that we're juggling that people just don't even know because they're not aware of it, right? And if they're not aware of it, how can they help us in terms of helping us grow professionally and as individuals? So why won't they like Zoom is about basically real life emotions and stories about our teammates coming to life about Zoom. So um, we, we kind of want to open up this new world to all professors, allowing them to open the doors that they always thought was going to be closed. You know, this is a chance for them to kind of like really get to understand a student outside of the education system, you know, because outside of the education system, we have work or we have families that we have to deal with and stuff like that. So I guess an example that I gave in the convention of the four C's was that we have a, um, basically we have stories. And one of the stories is that, you know, during Zoom, it gives you the ability to like take your classes anywhere you go. But because you're taking those classes anywhere you go, that means you're taking them with you to your country. And when you go to a different country and you're trying to run on a U.S. time base, it kind of starts to get difficult, right? So we experience either time like differences where like here in America, it might be like 12 p.m. But in another country, it might be like in the middle of the night. And because they're like making so many loud noises in terms of trying to learn, either they're tired, they're fatigued, or they're even bothering their own family in the same room. And their family starts to get mad at them like, hey, what are you doing at 12 o'clock at night? And then the students like, well, I'm studying. I am pursuing my education. But does the professor know that? Does the professor know that the student's taking that extra step, you know, to be there awake at 12 o'clock at night and try to like process all this information that you're speaking? Because sometimes we zone out because we have so many things running through our head. And especially if it's 12 o'clock at night, it's like, what do you expect? You know, would an American citizen be at 12 o'clock at night studying? No, not really. They would typically be in bed sleeping, but an international student, they they have to stay awake sometimes up to 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And if it's not a time difference, it may be just like the environment difference. Like, for example, there's a student who went to Mexico for the summer and she had a summer class, right? In the summer class, she had to... Um, do a huge presentation as like her final project, but what ends up happening because of the environment, it affected her ability to present. But what I mean is that in Mexico, Wi-Fi is actually powered by the solar, you know, it's by solar panels. So if there's no sun, there is no Wi-Fi. And if there is no Wi-Fi, there is no presentation that you can do and then your grade gets affected, right? So another thing about that too is that because the environment has such an effect, it, it doesn't just have to be sun, but it can be the rain, for example. If if it rains, that means there's clouds. If there's clouds, there is no sun. If there's no sun, there's no ability to be able to like go out there and do your presentations to get a good grade. But does the professor know that? Does the professor know that the student is struggling, is crying, is like doesn't even know what to do at this point? But the student doesn't back out. We continue and we do the best that we can and we find solutions for our problems. Like for example, that student, she had to drive 30 minutes to the nearest city in Mexico just to present just to present, just so she can get that good grade. And then she had to drive 30 minutes back to her hometown. So it's just like, it's all these small little struggles that other students or other professors don't really know what's going on. So our Zoom, I mean, why don't they like Zoom? It's like that one-way ticket of like, okay, let me take you with me. Let me take you and get a little bit of my life just so you understand what exactly we're dealing with and why, how we are able to like move forward and make like these changes. But now we're speaking up, you know, that's the whole purpose of this video is that we are speaking up. We are telling and sharing our stories. Obviously all of our stories are backed by secondary and, <laughs> um, research so it's not just like us saying stuff but it's actually backed up with research as well um but yeah this is like us showing you guys what we go through and we're asking for help you know we're finally like hey please help us like we're dealing with a lot right now so that's a little bit of what to expect for the upcoming video so i don't want to give too much but yeah <laughs> yeah just a little trailer trailer thanks yeah. thanks Ruben. um also yeah, we yeah, i can't uh, wait to see it sorry sorry i'm oh, sorry go ahead go, go yeah go ahead. I, was, I was speaking um i was just gonna say that we also published the um, article research and we, it just came out so um you might as well just check that out i'm gonna send it to the link as well <laughs>
<laughs> oh, bye, yeah. Jenny. So, yes, I think um, that the hidden classroom in some ways is even more hidden when we're teaching on Zoom. And sometimes the students don't turn on their cameras. And we asked at CES at the conference uh, for the, the instructors, what do you think if you see a bunch of black <laughs> squares? Oh, they're shopping, they're playing video games. <laughs> so we're gonna flip those squares for you and show you what's really going on. That's this is so wonderful. That's so important. I can't I can't I can't tell you how many times I hear I hear people actually becoming angry because somebody isn't isn't doesn't have the screen on or something like that. And then when I was at the presentation, you know, to hear, well, you know, my family's there and there 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 are some people who are sleeping in the same room. I think that was one of the things that I that I heard. Um I uh I you know I was like, oh, this is important stuff. You know, I, I, I so you know just to communicate that again to all of you, uh, how how vital I think this this perspective that's coming out through this this collaborative interaction is. Um, I'm, I'm super impressed with this. Um, I come I come I come at this through through racial linguistics and looking at the at the racisms that are you know associated with this as as well as um, you know I, I just just wanting to understand what this what what the multilingual students in in the classroom are thinking and where they're coming from we have um you know I, you know i i have i have a, i have a woman who's in, immigrated from africa who has three children and a husband and a job that she's taking care of as well as trying to go to school these um trying and 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 then with the students in the classroom uh, so there's understanding the multilingual students' perspectives, but with the students in the classroom, there's this um, the the the, the non-multilingual students. Um, almost almost all of my uh, students, um, my all of all of almost all of my white students specifically uh, are coming at this from a monolingual perspective, and from you know there's some there's some xenophobia that's that's sometimes included in this. So I'm trying to convince them that 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 being multilingual is a sign of great learning and accomplishment <laughs> and 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 I want to communicate that to you too um do you have do you have any 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 additional thoughts things that you'd want to leave with with the teachers at at my my humble community college and I, I say that I say that with great pride um you know the things that 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 you can leave them with that will help them as teachers to to move forward from this. I, I should, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll say mine because I think that the students should be the ones to speak last and conclude. But I do want to say one thing. One of our precepts that keeps getting worn out again and again is that what's good teaching for the multilingual students is good teaching for everyone. And you speak about ratiolinguistics. Um, there, there are socioeconomic inequities. And uh, once again, it's so helpful for us to learn more about what's going on in our students' lives. During the pandemic, um, one student who consistently turned off her sound and had a black screen, uh, when I finally met with her one-on-one -on -one and I said, would you please turn on your sound and your screen? It turned out that in her apartment, the fire alarm was going off and she couldn't get it turned off. And she didn't, she was trying to do the class anyway, but she didn't want to bother everybody else with this fire alarm. You know, it's just incredible. Another student was taking the class in her car because that's the only place she could do it. Another was doing all of the work on her little smartphone. So when she would you know, make some typos. Well, it's kind of understandable. Um, when we flip those screens and see what's going on, I think we can help so much more. Mm. Now, now I want to turn it over to the students. I want to say something real quick. I think it's so surreal that we get the opportunity to actually talk with professors because I would never have thought that would be possible in like universities in my country maybe to be this intimate and to be this close to teaching staff and to let them know what 
they could improve on because I would never have thought it was possible. <laughs> and it's I think uh, the work that you're doing is very uh, amazing as well. And I, I'm really grateful that we have the support of our professors and, you know, that our work is being received well by uh, teaching staff from other universities as well. I think that's very surreal. And I do appreciate you um, also addressing the sort of divide between international and multilingual students with the uh, students who speak English as a native language. Um, because one of the points that I think Dr. Caesar brought up um, during the first video was that the professor was trying to bond with the students by bringing up the example of football. But uh, what they don't know is that it actually separates, it um, increases the amount of alienation that I feel when I don't understand the concept and it makes me feel more separated from my classmates as well. And it makes me feel less engaged, you know, that makes me feel less wanting to engage with students all around me. And it makes me them feel like I'm not wanting to engage with them as well. So I think it's very important that we address that as well. And I think it's very it's very comforting to know that we have the support of um, our professors as well that we look up to so much. So thank you. Mm. Beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah. Just want to say thank you as well because, um, as you said, like it's. I, I don't say like it's the only chance, but it's very rare chance that we can speak up to the professors. Like, oh, we want this, we want this. This is the good thing to see us. Like, you should see our side too. Like, we always just like see your side, see your thought. But here is our thought, and yeah, it's very, very, very uh, good opportunity to like just share. And also, I want to point out like, okay, uh, it's not only like to prefer for a professor to just see, but like as the student. Uh, American students, like the friends in class, like the classmates, or even the international students, like you and I, can learn so many from like, just the video. Like for like it's just for example, like for the third video about like the right grammatically, like I like as a different language, like we learn the second language based on our first language, and that's why I tend to like have always have mistake on like uh, not have the article or SES or like miss up the tense all the times, and as uh, Doctor. Sisa say like uh, her pet fear is like why don't you just keep a uh, consistency about the tense and then this I just like just realize just like after so many years of seeing this it's just realize like, oh that's my mistake that's why that's a that the reason like, it's not thing like I I think like that's something wrong with me but I just like blaming myself well, I I'm not good at English I'm not good at English I need to do more do more but like I didn't really know the reason why but yeah, just like watching this video, just like finally I realized that, oh, this is the reason why I just keep that like repeatedly. The mistake is I like, keep it pure. So it's not for only the professor, but it's for everyone who just need to have awareness together. Like just to living in the community and like, having their international student and multilingual speaker. Yeah, just, just, just to like living together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think everybody else kind of said what I wanted to say but, um, <laughs> um, two things that I want to leave you with is um, our YouTube channel just subscribe and uh, follow us and I think we're gonna have more series coming um, I believe two more for sure and also um, I would like to share my screen real quick because this is what um, we put our times into kind of put it all together and then um, we just got it published so just uh, if you have some time, just kind of like spread it around, um, <laughs> kind of because the main theme of this is kind of raising awareness, and um, we kind of really put a lot of time into it. So, and we'd like to share with the rest of the professor. Yeah. When I get done, there there should be quite a few hits on that page. I'm open. Thank you. Yeah. Feel thank free you. to use any sauce for us. Like, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cite us, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to hear Vivian. Do you have anything? I don't want to cut you off. Oh, no, no worries. Well, I'm just excited that I have the opportunity to speak up for others who are just like me, because I know, like I said earlier, a lot of students don't speak up for themselves. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to speak up for them and myself. I hope that, you know, I know it's so cliche that we always say just listen to us or like, like, yeah, like, it's important to like include everyone. But like, sometimes I feel like people forget about it. You know, so it's like, it's exciting. And I'm hoping that 
professors look at our team's research and our videos and run with it. You know, it doesn't just stop by listening to us, but they take it with them and they tell others the stories. You know, it's just like it, it, this story belongs to everyone, not just us. I mean, yes, we created it, but we created it so that other people can use it to like, express themselves or like bring awareness to the situation. So I just hope that when professors see this, it doesn't just stop by seeing us and it continues forward into expanding into a larger audience that we could ever imagine. So help us help other people. That's all I can really say. Oh, fine. Vivian always comes up with the perfect slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. I am, am just going to not say much of anything here at the end, except for thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, when I when I saw the this presentation, it was the last one that I saw, and I, I stumbled into it accidentally because uh, I met Joyce in the hallway, and 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 lo and behold, there was a friendly face, and so um, I followed that friendly face into into your presentation, um, where um, I was I was thinking to myself, now this this looks important, and I should I should share it, and I'm going to hope that other people who watch this video also take the time to share it with other people and, and get it to spread around a little more. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things is that that we don't do enough sharing of these important things and we do a lot of sharing of things that are trivial. Um, so I'm gonna encourage people to share it, um, which would be the same for you. I will send the video to to the, the link to Joyce and um, I will go from there. Uh, I'm so grateful for, for this work uh, at MSU and and now it's a, it's a global thing yeah um, thank you we're thank very you. grateful to give you. you guys some applause from mm -hmm. from here um, I'm going to go ahead and 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 log out and so that we have something that I that I can share uh, with with my colleagues I'm going to go ahead and stop the sharing now.